Hi everyone, welcome back to the Market Chat. My name is Richard Moglin. Joining me for the third time is Jim Ropel, hedge fund manager and the founder of GrowStockMentor.com. Always a pleasure speaking with you, Jim, and and you're actually uh, the uh, the guest I've had on the most. So it, it's awesome to have you back on. You're always a positive light here, no matter what the market conditions are. So uh, thanks again for for coming on and and sharing your experience with us. Dude, I love coming on, and I think you're so good at what you do. Your demeanor, your questions, just the, the, you're like the uh, Johnny Carson of uh, financial interviewers. <laughs> I'll, t- I'll take that 100%. Um, so Jim, I, th- I think it would be great to, to start things off with kind of your, your take on the market. Uh, what are things looking like? How are growth stock leaders acting? And um, also get, in, get into some market leaders that you're watching right now. I see EMPH on your screen, which had an a, a earnings gap up today. But before that, I'd just love to hear about your overall take on the market conditions. Well, the conditions have changed rather abruptly. Uh, I wasn't certain we needed a follow through day, but we did get one. And growth leaders really came on. That was mm-hmm. kind of the first time really after the pull. And when the market topped in Feb, growth stocks were fits and starts all year. And right. the market shifted around a commodity. And it, this time the market turned up and grow, uh, several growth stocks were out before the follow through day. Net, Affirm, yeah. Upstart, uh, whatever, DigitalOcean. And so it went from a market where can slim type growth traders, intermediate term trend followers couldn't make money to they, they almost couldn't not make money. Right. So I really was with, I mean, I, I went long. I was, a, I, w- I owned a few before the turn and then I kept building, but uh, you ever play gin rummy? Yep. Yep. Okay. So, you know, your objective is to make sets and lay them down before the other players. And if another player lays all his sets down and he goes out of all the cards, all the cards you hold in your hand go against you. And that's kind of like building inventory. And then you, so we're up what, 10, 9, 10 of 11 days in a row. Right. And the market was extended in days and percentage gain, and a player went out. And yeah. everybody who bought late got stuck to holding these. My grandfather would go, You got caught with a mitt full of cards, huh, kid? <laughs> and so if you continued to buy into the advancing market, a player went out on you today and the, and the leaders, you know, really pulled back. Right. So that's kind of where we, I, I think today is perfectly normal and really, you know, the market was extended in days in a row up and yeah. percentage of a move up, but we were, we're nowhere near extended above the 50 day moving average. And so I just think this was a really, so far was a normal day. Volume on NASDAQ, I believe was down 14%. Uh, it was a pretty good reversal. You know, we were up. We made, I think my alert went off on a new high on the NASDAQ 100. But, you know, you can't expect it to go up 20 days in a row. I think I think eight or I think nine of 11 is really an enormous run. Mm-hmm. So I'm good. And in your opinion, um, for for more can slim traders who are more swing trader, position trader, do you would you kind of recommend people wait for that fall through day to occur? Um, or as things start to set up and, and leaders are breaking out of pivots, um, do you think they should take those opportunities even if the fall through day hasn't quite happened coming out of the correction? It would certainly mandate you be a more aggressive trader and a swing trader because a swing trader is willing to deal with, you know, five, six days in a row up and then they'll jump out. Right. But an intermediate term trend trader is really gonna have to be v- extremely aggressive to be buying before a follow through day, assuming you can justify that a follow through day is necessary, which right. I think was ambiguous. Right. In the last pullback, it was not, I, I kept on saying, well, if we out- undertake, undercut the recent lows, it's definitively, we'll need a new fo- another follow through day, mm-hmm. but we never got there. Right. So it was kind of like, um, you know, it's like getting extra cherry on top. You didn't need it, just a little more conviction. And I'll tell you, one of the greatest stocks I ever had was called E Research, and it broke out in the bottom of the O2 after the dot com bubble bear market, mm-hmm. and it came out a week or two before the follow through day, and we had four stocks that came out before this follow through day. So, you know, listen, Net Cloudflare was really, really telling people this market 
well, either Cloudflare is going to reinvent the wheel, yeah, or or we're going to the or the bull market or growth is being supported. That was really what I kind of gained from that move. Gotcha. So, I'm not sure if I I forgot the question. Now I'm just talking. No, I, I was just going to ask you like uh, what kind of your recommendation for people either waiting for that falter day for confirmation or it's okay to kind of as setups appear take some opportunities that if, if they work become a little bit more aggressive. Like you said, this correction wasn't like super strong. So it's kind of ambiguous whether we need that fall through day confirmation. Uh, yes, definitely. And, you know, we were so close to the highs. It was more of a yeah. internal pullback where the, you know, everyone's been talking about this. So I'm just going to repeat what everyone else has been saying. But your top five most heavily weighted NASDAQ stocks held the index up. Well, underneath, 20% of all NASDAQ stocks were down 50%. Yeah. And 50% of all NASDAQ stocks were down 20%. Well, the index remained within three, four percent of the five percent of the all-time high. Right. That's really unusual stuff. So did you need a follow-through day? Did how about this? Here's a question. Did we have an internal bear market? Not quite. You know, yeah. If you yeah. believe that, yeah. I mean, so yeah, I guess follow-through day was really important. And you know, if you just strip out those top five, six big monsters we could be in a whole new bull market, but the MDY, the mid cap index, can I show it to you guys real quick? Yeah, go for it. I want to just, so this kind of goes to current market conditions. Uh, share screen, MDY. So this is really bothersome to me mm -hmm. and that this broke out mm -hmm. and then it rolled back in. Now that's, you know, if this turns out to be just another, this is a fake out breakout and we go down and I mean, there's no reason we can't retest the lows. We've not definitively come out of this. Yeah. And M W uh, I W O I W M. What M D Y uh, M D C M D C is that the small cap? Uh, I W O or, is small well, cap growth. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I W M Russell. I W M. It was getting so close to the highs. You can see the line I've drawn. Yeah. You know, uh, Luizio Amata says the higher the base or the bigger the base, the higher in space. Mm -hmm. when, when we come out of this one way or the other, and I was really inclined to believe we were going to come out the top because of all the leaders that were getting traction. Mm -hmm. But today was really, you know, it, it's becoming very iffy if that IWC. Mm hmm. I'm getting a little ulcer. Look at that. Look at how compressed. So see the black line I drew? Yep. The left side of it, the market is wildly vacillating above and below for months, four months. In the last month and a half, it has been holding super tight below. It's compressing. And that is what you see at the very end of a before a breakout is going to occur. Mm -hmm. So I'm, you know, discouraged a bit that MD. C did not hold its breakout and that the other indexes didn't follow. Right. So that's kind of a negative. Now volume was not high today, but again, you know, selling off late in the day, not good. Yeah. So I'm, I'm still stuck in the middle. If, if we don't break out, I have too much exposure and it doesn't even matter if you're in the leading stocks, if the market rolls over, they're all going to 99% of them are going to go down. Right. And that's what I was going to ask you, actually, kind of what's your outlook right now and how exposed you are currently given given the recent action? I was getting pretty optimistic with the action and the leaders right up until today. So I feel that I'm probably a little bit exposed, overexposed. I, I was probably a little bit I was definitely a little bit on margin today. Mm -hmm. uh, I let me stop sharing here. No problem. I I added ENPH this morning on this gap out breakout, which has been just a wonderful signal for me, you know, for 30 years. But again, I bought into a elevated market. I'm probably well. So, okay, so today I trim back. I'm probably about roughly fully invested between mm -hmm. a little hedging, a little selling, uh, paired back. I had probably a couple too many names. Just I'm preparing for what for a possible rollover, you know, right. for a fake failed breakout attempt. Right. which there's listen we've been over 200 days in this digestion it's not impossible that we go another 200 it's very unlikely 
but the market doesn't know what day it is. <laughs> right, right. And uh, just for everybody watching, we're recording this on Wednesday after the close. So obviously, uh, I'll try to get this out tomorrow on Thursday, but uh, stuff could happen tomorrow uh, and we could completely change our perspective on things. Um, but Jim, I, I wanted to talk to you through the action of the market leaders currently, uh, because I think that's always very helpful and it gives us a good understanding of kind of what's going on under the surface. So uh, maybe we could talk through some charts, AFRM, UPST, COIN. I'd love to hear your take on um, ASAN and, and you mentioned Cloudflare before as well. So uh, if I can share my screen or if you want to go ahead and share Wanda, that's that's cool as well. You, you, oops. Go ahead. Why don't you share the screen? Uh, actually, I, I'd love to have you uh, walk through a chart um, that, that shows up a little bit better okay. on the recording as well. All right, cool. Okay, we're good to go. Um, what stack would you like to look at first? Let's take a look at um, AFRM because this is one of the early leaders that broke out before that fall through day. Okay, this is my biggest holding. Mm -hmm. It's my number one largest position size. And today was a reversal. Not, well, it was a barely a reversal. It, it kind of was, I suppose, but there was no volume in it. Mm -hmm. So it's not, you have to weight it by how much volume you had. Now, price is more important, but Listen, this stock has just about everything. It has fundamentals. It has ramping sales. It doesn't have earnings. Mm -hmm. Let me just double check. I'll make sure I want to get that right. Yeah, so it doesn't have earnings yet, but these they actually missed big time. You look at, see right down here in the lower left, they missed yeah. big time yeah. last quarter, and the stock exploded higher. Right. Primarily, I would suggest off the, the fundamental Amazon news. So even though they missed, the stock was looking forward. I think this looks really, really good. You have in here, well, let me just go back to the daily. It shows up better. So on the opening day on an IPO, everyone knows it probably often trades the heaviest volume it's gonna trade for maybe years. Right. Sometimes it will never exceed opening day volume. 25.2 million, what happens when the, when the news comes out at, for Amazon? It trades up on 44.4 million shares. That right. is almost double only to be usurped by another massive gap up on 54 million and then another one of 53 that is so unusual that is that is clear whales coming in so you know relative strength is 97 uh a plus accumulation distribution it just it has everything i'm looking for except earnings mm -hmm. which is a critical factor um, and the market we are in seems to be letting stocks get away with that. So I, you know, listen, I'm okay with this being my biggest position. I love it. And one thing I've noticed. And what's is, the next one? Yeah. Well, well first uh, talk about AFRM a little bit more. Look at just the, the moving average of the volume. Th this, this is a telltale sign to me as well. Just that steady increase. There's more institutional interest in this name right now. Um, and talk to me a little bit about how you started a position in this name. Was it, was it on that 53 million? Uh, breakout here. I think they announced more news that day. They were partnering with, with somebody. Class. Yeah, go for it. Okay, so my average cost is 125. Mm -hmm. So I had to have bought some right here. Mm -hmm. I almost certainly added here. Mm -hmm. And I, I actually added a couple thousand more right here. Um, just because I was really bullish. And it just now it, when it closed mid range that day after this long move, and also the level of extension between the 50 day and the yeah. stock, it was getting excessive. Yeah. So we just need to work off, you know, the stock can either go sideways or down and the 50 days heading up towards about 130 on a clock face. Right. So these two are gonna converge, They're guaranteed. As sure as the sun goes down tonight, the 50 days is gonna converge with the stock price. And I, you know, I've got a good cost in this. And so I'm just gonna chill. I'll shake off a lot of my other lesser quality names right. to try and sit with this. And so you're kind of just, waiting out for a base here. You want some consolidation near all time highs. Are you doing any of your hedging strategies versus the 50 day or you're just kind of sitting with your core position? I did sell a calls on about 10% of my position, which went out last Friday. I covered them at a tiny gain because um, the stock really didn't come down much. Yeah. But uh, now the market's probably mandating that might be a more prudent strategy and it would be very re re reasonable to be say 20, 30% hedged in this thing. Mm -hmm. Perfect. So I, I'm unhedged in it right now. Gotcha. 
Um, another one that a lot of people are talking about and, and probably shook a lot of people out last week is UPST. Um, I'd love to hear your take on, on both the company fundamentals as well as the overall stock chart, which which has been one of the one of the most powerful leaders. But recently, it's kind of changed character a little bit. We had a big drop on volume, um, and it looks to me like it needs a little bit of a consolidation period here. And probably the 50 day is going to catch up with this one as well. The 50 day might catch up with it tomorrow morning. Yeah, um, yeah. You know, this true. is a company. You know, it really could. It, listen, we could gap down tonight. I, couple of companies reporting earnings tonight yeah twilio or twitter twilio and uh service now i think reports tonight so i don't know how they're doing at this minute but uh yeah this is listen almost every single stock that's um is gonna come down to their 50 day three to five times a year maybe mm-hmm. even more if it's a lethargic name so inevitably this is going to occur again the fundamentals are awesome they're using ai for loans and they they show all these metrics why it's better than the traditional model mm-hmm. um so the fundamentals are extremely good and the accumulation i mean this see this breakaway gap right here mm-hmm. is not your traditional um long digestion but this volume of this 18 million shares is a, now i didn't buy i don't own this i've never bought a share of this mm-hmm. okay you know, you listen. Bill missed him. Bill missed some of the greats for whatever reason. He, he wasn't running a screen at that moment. It just didn't appeal to him. Uh, and then you kind of have some really uber short digestions in here. Yeah. Where you probably could have bought some right here. Probably could have bought some there. But you know, let's see what the volume's looking like in here. No real volume on these days, so I probably would have stayed away from it. Yeah. Um, but I think. You know, the first pullback to the 50 day is probably a really good chance opportunity to possibly get in here. So maybe the market goes sideways for two, three days or two, three weeks. We get a little digestion. And I think, you know, 99 RS volume has not been, you know, look at the blue wall, the blue skyscrapers amongst the red. Even yesterday was not a train wreck of a volume day. Right. Um, You know, it's kind of like a Gandhi day. This stocks that go from 100 to 1,000 have some days where they go down on volume. Mm-hmm. They're Gandhi went in, you know, Mother Teresa and Gandhi went into a restaurant one time and they both yell at the waiter. They're both virtuous people. They're great, great people. And they went on to do great things. This stock may have had a Gandhi day yesterday with bad volume, but it still can go on to do great things. One Gandhi day does not make it a train wreck. It's just one day. And it's still well above the 50. Mm-hmm. So what would you be watching for at this point? Some type of, of uh, second stage base to form against the 50 day and then looking for an entry up the right hand side. What would you be waiting for with UPST? You know, I want to see how it deals with the 50 when it gets yeah. there, assuming it does get there. And you know, ideally I want a base, but stocks like this, they just tend not to do that. Um, I would suggest that if the market does come out of those long uh, digestions we're in, this is going to be one of your leaders. Okay. It was out before the market. Yeah. It, it, it jumped to prominence. It, it's got, it's a liquid leader. It really has everything you're looking for. So if you get a secondary entry point at the 50 day, but be careful, 50 day pullbacks are messy affairs. They're not touch it and immediately just go. That does happen about 10, 15% of the time, but that's, you know, it's an 85% chance it's going to undercut the 50 whip them back above and below, shake out. Yeah. You know, it can monkey around above and below the 50 day for a week or two, or it could level out and it could be around it for several weeks. Mm-hmm. It's unlikely that because this is such a powerful leader, but I would love, so I want to see how it handles the 50 and any type of action where it, it starts to come back up, I'll buy the strength. I'm not going to, I'm just not a weakness buyer. It's going to have to show me some institutional level of support or power before it's going to entice me 100 percent. but this is one i would yeah. certainly want to be in yeah yeah and you you mentioned in, in something in there that you, you you mentioned it was a liquid leader and we've talked about liquidity and why it's so important to you in, in previous uh, podcasts and interviews but just to say it again for people who maybe missed those previously why is liquidity so much so important to you um and why is that a characteristic that uh you really look for in a potential leader because if you don't have institutions holding the stock, the volatility is going to be much, much higher. 
Mm -hmm. And if the stock isn't liquid enough for institutions to get in, who's going to be the big whale to drive it up? I mean, it's not me. I can move a stock for a day or a couple hours or an hour, mm -hmm. but I cannot hold it up for indefinitely. You need major hedge funds in there, major, you know, billion dollar hedge funds, or uh, it, it's hard to understand the significance of liquidity yeah. until you run a ton of money mm -hmm. because you can just go buy your thousand shares, your hundred shares, you get in, you get out. It doesn't matter when you start to run large amounts of money, you recognize I can't buy most stocks because they can't, I can't get in and get out without moving the price against me too big. And then all of a sudden you go, wow, well, if I can't do this, liquidity is really a big deal. It's yeah. So it's, it's a big deal because you need the big dogs to move them up and you need the big dogs to absorb the people when profit taking occurs and reduce the volatility. Yeah. And just to make it really simple, I often say, what would Bill do or, you know, how did Bill do it? If you look at Bill's, most of his monster, monster names, they were almost all liquid. Yeah. You know, if you look at the ones I've made the bulk of my money in, they were all trading 100 to 300 million average daily dollar volume. Mm -hmm. Now you can make money certainly in smaller names that are less liquid, but you're more swing trading in those names or right. you're, you know, now if, on the other side of that, if you catch an illiquid name that you can hang on to through the volatility and it grows into a liquid name, you're probably in a stock that's going up five times. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, if it's going to go from 2 billion market cap to 20 billion, you, the volatility you're going to have to endure is going to be unbelievable, but it, 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 that's a life change. That's a game changer. Yeah. And that's, that's almost what UPST did. Um, back before it's it's huge gap ups it i mean the ranges were like 14 percent every single day but recently after this recent earnings gap up it's gotten a little bit tighter and, and behaved a little bit more orderly and you can see that in market smith the number of funds have increased there's there's some high quality funds in there so you, you can see that a little bit in the changing character even with this stock i don't know how to adjust to get the average true range yeah back you know early on versus right now but um what I do love is the tightness at the bottom of that cup. It yeah. just yeah. was, it just, it's like heavy volume with no further price progress down um, and some good, a couple good accumulation days in there. But your major signal, you know, you look at the drive in volume too after that uh, heavy volume to the downside. Yeah, that looks. That's a major yeah. signal right there. Now, I don't know. You know, I don't really believe in insider information being leaked out. I don't, I think the markets are really, really fair and ethical. I, I think the amount of insider trading is so low, Yeah. but you could have just had people who are in the know not sell. That's enough to, to do that. Um, so I don't think there was a lot of insider information going on in there. I really don't, but. That's but you're setting up nicely. Yeah. Um, so another one you mentioned earlier is Cloudflare Net. And uh, this obviously is a, is a disruptor. Uh, once again, another one without really any, any earnings growth, uh, but the, the dramatic increase in price the past uh, few weeks, I'd love to get your take on. You said it was kind of a signal, um, but it's also kind of changing slope a little bit with this increase. So I, I'd love to hear your take on this chart. Okay, it's so powerful. Yeah. It's almost as if it's climactic. Yeah. Okay, it, 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 it's, so, it's, it's, it's not, I, it's, I don't believe it's a climax. I really do not, but it's so dramatically powerful. And the, and the relentless, is it like 14 days in a row in there? Yeah. I can't count yeah. them. Uh, that is just, and this was again, out before the follow through day. Mm -hmm. This is, if the stocks we're discussing here are the A plus names, these are the names you want to be focusing on. And again, this is a $47 billion company. Mm -hmm. All right, market cap. This was not that way. You know, if you just go back to the left side of this chart, it, it was, you know, $5 billion company. This has grown up. Okay, perfect example about what I said. If you could get in there and deal with the volatility, but the period, I have to open up my chart so I can get a better look at this. Yeah, and um, uh, and your friend oh, Cubby, Cubby, Cubby Bears was on this uh, early back near its IPO. And I know this is one of his favorites. Yeah, for sure. I mean, you know, Cubby gave me this stock. My wife bought it. Yeah. My unfortunately deceased partner in my crypto fund, I'm executor of his estate and trust. And I just got access to his brokerage account. He's got thousands of shares in there. Okay. 
I mean, you know, Cubby Bears tipped off a lot of people to this monster. Yeah. But if you, you know, sitting through December of last year through June of this year, you had to be a diehard fundamentalist. It was living well below the 50 day. Yeah. Okay. My wife owned it. My wife bought it at 20, you know, and her management risk management style is, oh, it's down, close the computer, you know? So I'm not kidding around, yeah. but she doesn't have yeah. a truckload of it. So that's the only way you can deal with that. If you're, you know, listen, it's just kind of like the 50 day moving average is, is the guardrail. Mm-hmm. You know, forget swing traders, intermediate term trend traders could have never sat through the break in February, March. Um, you know, I could see where you might have bought it back in April, yeah, but then stopped out of it again in May. Yeah. So anyway, the, the, the point I want to really illustrate is I was saying for a very long period of time, this and NVIDIA and Tesla are your three canaries in the coal mine. These are your true market leaders. Yeah. Even though Tesla went dormant and it, it lost its prior power and character, it re- just reasserted itself. Yeah. Don't think for us. I mean, I'm not making a prediction, but it wouldn't shock me enough all by if the end of, you know, come early summer, it's not unthinkable. Tesla is a $1.5 trillion market cap. Okay, it, it is acting that way. It, it went, well, let's just look at it. Yeah, let's bring it up. All right, now I'm the cat. Now I'm driving the bus here. here. <laughs> no, I was going to ask you about this one next. So this is perfect. Okay, so, you know, you had a climax run, mm-hmm. in my opinion, bad break. And it, right here to me, the stock's dead to me. Yeah. And then it, it, it tries to break up. Now it's really dead to me. And at this point, it's just locked in a bad downtrend. But all of a sudden, you know, I didn't really love this right here. I thought this was your first up leg and I, relative strength was extremely low. It might've been in the sixties or fifties. I'm not sure. Yeah. But when it cracked right here above this high, that's your first higher high of, of significance to me in my assessment. And also you had this nice big bed of volume in here. Right. But it just, it was not the stock it was of past at this point. It was lethargic and I underestimated it. What I think this is, is kind of like a basketball underwater where it tries to break out, but the market's not good, tries to break out again, market's not good. And it's just being held underwater. And all of a sudden we got that follow through day, which, or well, let's just say the market turned up where yeah. growth was allowed to perform. Right. And whoosh. Now this is not an exhaustion gap to me. It's a breakaway gap. So we're at a market cap of uh, just over a trillion. I know it sounds crazy, but this stock is, is and, and listen, we have two days in a row where it closes at the low of the day. Yeah. It's tired yeah. and it's a bit extended, but some sideways action here. And then, and, and there's no reason we can't take off. Like if you had an internal bear market in the market, this could be one of your, this net, the names we're talking about could be the leaders. Yeah. You pick some good stocks to talk about. Yeah, well, I'm glad you're watching the same ones. That, that's awesome. Um, and and a lot of people, uh, so I, I asked for questions on Twitter. And one that I saw so many times was, how do you, Jim, define extended? And maybe you could talk about both on a daily time frame and also weekly time frame and, and, and kind of the actions you take when you own an extended stock and when you're also watching an extended stock. Okay, let's just look at the index, the current yeah. index. So we rally from, well, let's just, at least percentages. Yeah. Call it 7% from right here up to here. Mm -hmm. Now that's a good percentage move, but it's only about 2% over the 50 day. So you kind of have to look at both the level of extension over the 50, which is really my major issue. Yeah. Okay. And you, so I believe Eve did a study for me and she proved that the average market, let's just, let's just omit the first leg up because you can get much more extended early on right. in a, in, you know, when the market first turns up after a pair. Right. But after the first extension, it's gonna probably have a hard time being extended over the 50 day by more than 7%. Every percentage point over seven, you're really getting into rare air. And also the environment you're in depending if animal spirits are dominating or if we're fed easing or, or, contra- or contraction, the market will permit indexes and stocks to go further or less than normal mm-hmm. um, above and below. So you have to know the environment and the recent history. Are animal spirits dominating or are we you know, in a, in a much more tame environment? 
so like I was not too concerned right up in here because we were so close to the 50 yeah. and we also had about, we had three, four days in a row of digestion, which is not that big, but I was still thinking we could still go up several percentage points. Mm-hmm. Um, and the same thing, now let's go to like um, Tesla. So right in here, the stock, uh, wand is not formatted for this Apple computer, but let's just say that in here, the stock can get five, six, two, three, four, five percent over the 50 day. That's the environment we're in right mm-hmm. here. The market's not healthy underneath you know, the internals, but all of a sudden the market lifts off and all of a sudden, now this is your new level of extension. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, that's 20% or 15 or 20. We're not in the same environment that we were in right here. So now we can say, well, whatever the, pr- normally I can right click on this and I can get the exact to the percentage, you know, uh, yeah. of extension, which I can't you now, but this is the new level of what the market will let occur. Mm-hmm. And so every time the market would get this level of extended or a little bit more, I'm going to probably want to hedge 30, 25 to 35, 40% of my position. And if it gets even more extended, I'll continue to hedge. Now I really don't want to hedge my whole position because I'm always this big bull. And I, I, I don't know if it could climax run this. It's not unthinkable just because mm-hmm. it has a market cap this big does not mean animal spirits couldn't just get in there and, and, and send it. So I would never, it would be very rare that I would on an individual name hedge 100% of my position, unless we were in a bear market and I'm trying to push gains out to a, a, a year of a uh, long-term gain or something like that. Mm-hmm. Then I would hedge the whole thing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> is that a long explanation? No, that was awesome though. Um, and one thing I noticed with the Tesla chart is even though it had another climax run and started this long basing process, it obeyed that that 40 week, the 200 day moving average pretty much during this entire base. Is that something that stands out for you? Is that something that you look at? In hindsight, I do. Yeah. But when it was doing it, I was it, yeah. totally disrespecting the stock. Yeah. I did not. Well, first of all, let's just go backwards here. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm having a tough year this year. And the roots of my bad year were in being up over 100% across the board last year. Mm-hmm. The probability of having this climax run right here, yeah, a reload, a base, and then another one, a digestion, and then, an, you know, this is a climax run right here. Okay, so you've got, I don't know how you're going to count them, whether you have two or three of them. Yeah. You know, um, this might be the only stock I've ever seen do this, and I'm 56. Yeah. I don't know if we'll see more. I mean, the innovation cycle is ramping so hard. I do think we're going to see a few, maybe a few. Mm-hmm. But I'll be blunt, I, I, Eve and I both killed it, killed it in here. And I think I was in it a little bit in here, but Eve maintained the, uh, she stayed steadfast after it and has been in it. She still, Eve is still holding stock she bought down here mm-hmm. uh, in the hedge fund. I'm not kidding around, but I just kind of gave up on it. I mean, I, I did a study again. Stocks just, it's so unusual to get a reload climax run and let alone yeah three of them so i did not i thought the because of the probabilities i was and and actually the character of the stock had changed okay yeah what the how the stock was acting right right through here was nothing like it was through here so you now listen see how tight this is this can you see everyone what looking at in september of october of last year yeah this looks identical to iwc in the index so the volatility is very high here, but then over time it compresses and compresses and gets tighter and tighter. And that's when you get moves. That's when you can get a move like this. Um, you, you, you have to call this pretty tight in here. Yeah. Okay. But I just, because I think it's so important, please note in here through September, October, November, and then let's look at what's going on right now with mm-hmm. IWC. Mm-hmm. It's the same thing. Mm-hmm this is exactly what you'd want to see. Now, the issue is, I don't know if it breaks to the upside or the downside. Exactly. But the action of the leaders, the growth leaders, lead me to believe that it's going to be to the upside, contrary to today's action. But today's action has to, you know, I have to subtract a little of my positivity out of it because of the action today. You've got a lot of positivity to spare, so uh, you're still very bullish. But I have a lot of words. (laughs) Um, 
Yeah, I, I wanted to hear your take because I know you, you also run the crypto hedge fund as well. Um, so I wanted to, to, to pick your brain about a few crypto related companies that, that maybe you're trading or, or maybe you're just watching um, HUT. Um, but maybe we can start with coin because uh, that's one that I actually have a position in. So I love to hear your take on this one. OK, it's not fair to take me at full strength because I am so bullish on crypto. Look, I know the ETFs were just launched and we're probably, you know, maybe we're getting the hangover effect now. And, you know, the, it was buy the news, sell the rumor. Right. Uh, there's a lot of leverage in the futures market right now. So those guys need to be shaken out. Everybody, if you're not following Will Clemente on Twitter, he is your go to guy. Will Clemente is the number one on chain analyst. And uh, I'm going to expand on this. Okay. For cryptocurrency yeah, for coins, it. there's a whole new me method of technical analysis called on chain metrics where they can identify who owns how many coins, how long they've held them for, what's their history, what are they most likely to do. It is the most valuable information. And based on that, and talking to Will, which you can get him on Girl Stock Mentor. He comes on every two weeks uh, or, or just go on, on whatever Twitter. The market is incredibly bullish with the long-term holders, the whales, not just the, you know, in the bear market we had through the summer, mm -hmm. what happened is as acceptance of the crypto came in, a lot of new institutions came in and they all got shaken out. So they were whales, but they weren't long-term holding whales. Now those people were all blown out through the summer. Now what's left are the whales who've been holding for five years, eight years, six years. Guys, I mean, me, I've been holding forever. So I'm way on a tangent. I own coin, these shares, Coinbase, and I was overly optimistic about it back here. You know, I probably bought some right here, got shaken out. I bought it back right here and I held almost a lot of that. I did get shaken out of some, mm -hmm. but coming up through here, I made it a full position. Yeah. And... Uh, this acts really well. Look at the blue volume coming in here. Mm -hmm. This is really the major on-ramp for the average man into the crypto place, into the crypto world. And, you know, Eve brought this up the other day. She, look at this. I see E. Yeah. And let's go to a weekly, okay? Well, let's better go to a monthly. They're, these have a similarity and... DAQ exchanges kind of have this line from uh, the movie trading places, whether the customer makes money or loses money, Duke and Duke make the commission. These things just seem, it's kind of like buying coin today. It's probably like buying new NY, remember NYE, NY, NYX or, mm -hmm. or any of these exchanges in the first year or two, CBOE was public. Uh, listen, crypto is not going anywhere every single day. The amount of funding coming in just expands the innovation, the developers, the acceptance. You know, if you're coming out of a engineering school, you're either going to work for Tesla or a blockchain company. Though, though people don't want to go. Wall Street investment banks are scrambling to lure these guys in because they don't want to go. The, these brilliant minds in Ivy League schools, they don't want to go to crypto. You know, and by the way, Elon Musk is a you know, his companies are deeply involved in crypto. crypto. Uh, so anyway, back to this stock, it needs a digestion. It looks like mm -hmm. some of the others we've looked at. It's just extended here and there's no reason it can't, I mean, look at SI. Mm -hmm. it, it had a bad reaction to earnings, but by no stretch is it out of the game. Um, we cross 170, 175. I'm gonna build a position in this. This is your lead, I use these, God, these guys bank basically my crypto fund and there's no one else who can do it. They can't handle it. They also have a direct um, agreement with my OTC crypto broker where they journal the money right within the bank. Mm -hmm. It's it's the only game in town if you're a big player in, in crypto. Mm -hmm. So I understand they have a, an account that's called a SEN account where they literally, I'll sell my crypto through Cumberland Mining they'll journal, I'll send them the coins and they'll journal the money out of their Cumberland account through the SEN into my account at Silvergate. They, both accounts are at Silvergate. I understand why this is working. Um, so I'm on a monster tangent from coin. I like it, it needs a little digestion. Go, going back to the chart, if, if you could just bring that up very quickly. Um, you bring, yeah, bring up coin. 
Um, I also like the how it's got a, it's got that end and cancel of course with crypto, but also the other application, the NFT marketplace that kind of spurred this this recent influx in volume. I think that that's so new, but it, really to me it stands out that uh, that could be something completely innovative that that can completely change the the dynamic of this company. Listen, blockchain, NFTs, the metaverse. This is. I honestly think this is as, as big or bigger than EVs, than electric, mm-hmm. electric vehicles. I mean, this is, you know, look at Roblox, R-B-L-X. These guys are deeply ingrained in the crooks, the bedrock of the metaverse. Mm-hmm. And then Unity Software is another one. Now, I, I did stop out of a touch of my Unity today, which I just bought, mm-hmm. Um you know, again, I kind of got caught late in the gin game with a lot of cards in my hand. Um, so, you know, getting in these positions, getting in these stocks, getting positioned properly, you frequently have to work around the position to get it on, get it on in size, at a good cost basis so you can sit. Mm-hmm. Adding or starting new positions after nine of 11 days in a row up is, even though you're only a little over the 50 day, and it could get a lot more you're getting later in the game and, and a correction is likely or due. So yeah. I'm, I'm NFTs explosive here to stay. The metaverse is in, it's not even the first inning. It's like the first yeah. pitch. Yeah. This whole blockchain thing is going to be enormous. It is, it is already enormous, but it's going to be even in the next five to 10 years. I think it will rival and follow the build out of the internet. That's an enormous statement. That's a gigantic statement I just made, but I believe it to be true. One hundred percent. Well, we'll we'll have to see what Why don't happens. You throw another saw. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I want to talk about um, something that I learned from you last year that I think is really important um, in terms of how you interpret the market conditions. So, for you, how stocks react to earnings and their announcements kind of gives you feedback in terms of the risk appetite of large institutions. So maybe you could bring up a chart of EMPH, which which had a gap up today. And yeah, talk, talk about how you interpret um, earnings gap ups and how that informs um, you about the overall health of the market. Okay, so I think this, this week goes back to the crooks of last week. You had Tesla report, mm-hmm. it went slightly down and it just sat there. Um, Netflix did almost the same thing. It went down a little bit. They didn't, the, the, the people were like, oh, it's, it's, market's not reacting. Yeah. But they didn't go down. And then they turned up and took off. Um, the first couple monster stocks are big, I shouldn't say monster stocks, but the stocks that matter when they report are going to often set the tone for the balance of this earnings season. And look at what Tesla did subsequently. It ramped down, ramped on the 100,000 uh, car order. Mm-hmm. But I bought ENPH today. Mm-hmm. Of the, you know, call it eight, nine, 10 stocks I've made 90% of my money on, 60, 70% of them started on days just like today. Now, I did not, this close was not ideal, mm-hmm. but it was really pretty darn good. Okay. In, the, in a market that rolled over, yeah. this held in the upper, 25% of the whole, it's actually a very good close, I would say. And the volume, we traded 15 million shares going back all the way to December of last year. If that's the biggest volume we've had. That's fantastic. And actually, it's the second biggest, third biggest volume day we've had in a year and a half. Yeah. Um, and I, listen, I learned from Bill, you have a base that's kind of crummy or iffy. You have a sea change in price and volume, that just changes the day. All that pattern before, like he told me, um, Genentech was DNA. Mm-hmm. It exploded out. And he's like, the whole pattern behind that is, is irrelevant now. The price and volume is saying this is a different game. And the stock was really cleared almost all of the past price history. It, the, the, the personality just changed overnight. And I think that's, this was kind of set up, kind of, it wasn't ideal, but today is a game changer. Now, if the market is going to digest here, or God forbid, we break below the lows of these indexes, this is probably, it's not going to work. Yeah. Or if it does, it'll be fighting the, the, the person will be holding the basketball under the water. Um, but 
I think the market still is okay. I'm not willing to throw the towel in on the market by any stretch. And this is a phenomenal day. And the, listen, the action of the stock was greater than the per percent beat. Mm -hmm. It only beat by 22, 22% is really good, mm -hmm. but it's not a hundred percent or 200%. The reaction this stock had, had a lot more to do with future comments about the industry and the rising price of oil. Yeah. Okay. Like it's not a loss on me that FSLR is doing well and BE, you know, these are all companies like plug. Yeah. These are all, when oil starts to get really high, it makes all these alternative sources of energy look more appealing. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot going on here. <laughs> and yeah. oh, I forgot Tesla has this company called what's it called? Solar what? Solar city. <laughs> Right, right. He was ridiculed endlessly for taking that over. And now mm -hmm. look at it. What what if what if oil goes to 150? What's Solar City going to be worth? Right, exactly. And um walk me through your thought process with EMPH today. Um what when did it come up on your radar? Uh what are you looking for in the morning to start buying a gap up like this and what what will make you add more throughout the day as well? Okay. I was watching it last night mm -hmm. and I probably, I don't like to trade in after hours. So I just ignored it, but woke up this morning, I'm watching the tape in pre-market and I probably should have bought some there, but I waited to the open mm -hmm. and I bought some right on the open. I probably bought like a third of what I really wanted to hold. And then every time it went up a couple points, I bought 10% more, 20% more. And I just built it, you know, the end of a day, if a stock is up, if I want a position, I, I want at least 10% of my account in this stock by the end of the day. And hopefully before the stock is up 2% from my cost. Mm -hmm. So those are kind of my rules. So I, if the stock keeps progressing, I'm going to, I'm buying all day. Like I'll check really quick. Hold on. Yeah, go for it. I bought it. So my first entry was at 213 and I bought it one, two. I bought it five times today. Mm -hmm. Every order was smaller and smaller and smaller all the way up. So, you know, if I would have gone in and on the open, I opened up with a 30% position, 30% of what I wanted to own, and it never made a higher high, I would never buy another share. Mm -hmm. But as the day progresses, if it keeps going up, 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 I keep buying, buying, buying. Now, I probably had the, had the market closed strong and this closed at the dead high, I would have probably bought some more. Right. I mean, I would take it over. 10% is the floor. That's the minimum. It's, it's, it's not un, unusual especially in a uh, heated up market that I'll have an 18%, 15 to 18% position on by the close, mm -hmm. especially in a rager. This was, you know, okay, up here in the upper right, 727% volume increase. Right. And it, that that's rare. Okay. If you look in the upper left, this screen, this is a, a volume percentage change all day. The high, heaviest volume percentage change was ENPH. The second was a new SPAC, which is a cryptocurrency uh, custodian. BKKG, you can't yeah. really count that. That's like an IPO. Mm -hmm. So the really the first stock to compare it to is Dynatrace, DT, which was a 381% volume increase. You go down maybe 30 names and they're trading only 100% over normal daily. To give you a perspective on how thunderous a 729% increase in volume is. Now, it doesn't mean you can ignore your stop losses. If yeah. the market rolls over, this is going to get stopped out. Yeah. But it's very powerful. And um, how are you managing risk throughout the day when you're buying an earnings gap up? Uh, do you have stop losses in place? I know you said you just won't buy more if it if it doesn't continue go, going up in price. But if it undercuts that, that, um, that initial low that it sets, are you out or are you still just kind of watching it? I will... Listen, risk management is job one. You right. just, you have, must have it. And, but depending on how much, how big the position is, I may give it a little more than three, four, 5% before I'll cut the first, like I will not automatically sell if it undercuts the low of the day. Mm -hmm. I might, if my percentage loss is big, I might cut it before it gets to the low of the day if my percentage loss is too big. Right. It depends on what you perceive to be the upside 
based on the percentage of earnings beat, the fundamentals and the volume. Mm -hmm. um, you know, these types of names, you just kind of have to go after them because they're historically proven to be the stocks that lead. Mm -hmm. um, listen, I'm almost never going to take a loss more than if I take a 7% loss, I have let it get. I don't think I've taken a 7% loss on a total position in, in a couple in maybe in years. My average losses are probably around three to 5% on the whole position, mm -hmm. maybe more around four or five. Okay. By the time a stock's down 7%, I'm out of 90% of my position. Mm -hmm. No matter what, whether it's a breakaway gap or just a normal breakout. Um, I want to give every stock room to breathe, which means to me, I don't want to cut a loss unless I've given it at least 3%. Because if you're buying in an elevated market, any one day down, it's going to go down 3%. doesn't mean the stock has a problem. It just means the market was extended and you bought into an, you bought a breakout into an extended market. Right. You have to understand where you are in relation to the, you know, the recent run. Mm -hmm. So uh, buying gap out breakouts, risk management is critical, but I tend to let them go maybe more than I normally would. Like I didn't sell a single share of this stuff today. Yeah. And I bought it all, I bought it all the way through into the highs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and have you personally done any studies looking back in history on these, these earning gap ups, like uh, do you have any kind of guidelines for people who, um, who want to get into this and want to study it more, but um, yeah, do you have any kind of guidance for that? Yeah. I know you've the said in the bigger, past that, you're, yeah, go ahead. The bigger the gap in percentage and the heavier the volume, the more you want to get involved. And it's really, those are the ones that people are most afraid of. Right. Because the, you know, I bought, I paid up 23% in a day for a stock like SanDisk was one of my biggest winners ever. I think it closed up 23% on the day, but it had a 23, 2,300% volume pickup. And the earnings beat was like a 350%. It was just some phenomenal number. So the point is, the bigger the gap and the mm -hmm. heavier the volume, the more I want to get involved. Right. And that's an oversimplification. No, that's perfect. And, and, um, and you want to yeah. get on it, get, get some of it. I normally don't like to trade in the first 30 minutes. I, I, I rarely do it. If I do it, it's usually like a nibble or just a subtle ad. Mm -hmm. But with something like this, you want to get you want to acquire 20, 30% of your shares right away. I mean, immediately, the right. second the market opens. Right. And then only add as it, it's progress, but add smaller, smaller as the day goes on. Perfect. And Excuse uh, me. no, you're good. Um, and we, we've talked about some good earnings reactions, but I think it's fair to, to look at some bad ones. So uh, maybe we can bring up Snapchat um, and the, the entire social media space has kind of been weak. Facebook pins, of course. Um, but I, I'd love to hear your take on Snap as well. All right. Um, you know, if you let's just basically let's do this. Ugh. So composite rating, which is right here, is fifty. Mm -hmm. About two three weeks ago, it was ninety five. Yeah. Okay. This stock, it if you I'm going to pull up some of the things. Just went profitable. Look at these quarterly gains. They're mon look at last quarter was sixteen hundred percent earnings gain yeah. on a fifty seven percent sales growth. Look at these numbers. They're just ramping. Institutions have finally come in. You know, are in it. So it was really a qualified name. Like you, there's absolutely you could understand why you would be going after this. I bought it. I probably bought it right here. Mm -hmm. I was stopped out obviously right in here. I definitely bought it right here. Mm -hmm. for sure. I was stopped mm -hmm. out right here. And I think I bought it again right here. Um, I lost more money on this stock this year than any, maybe any stock in history. I had a big loss on this. The thing is, when it came down here, I stopped out immediately. Mm -hmm. Okay. I didn't know it was going to blow up, but mm -hmm. I didn't have to know. All I knew was it, it had broken its pivot. It had broken back into the base. And my percentage loss was telling me it, was, it wasn't working. Now, the other issue is it's kind of like stocks that had not broke. We follow through on the market about two weeks ago. The leaders are all out. Why are stocks still in bases this late after the follow through date? Institutions who are doing all the research said, we don't find this one to be the most attractive, or maybe there's something wrong with it and they're just staying away from it. 
So there was a signal that it hadn't come out earlier to me. Mm -hmm. But, you know, this stock is, the relative strength has declined to 18, accumulation distribution is D plus, yeah. and the sector has gone bad. Let's see what the sector strength is. Well, it's 61, which is down from 10 about five weeks ago. 61 is not the end of the world, but you can look at all these other social media companies and they're just getting pummeled. I mean, right. the government's after Facebook, the, you know, there's, there's all kinds of issues going on. Um, you know, Facebook's having, uh, Facebook's percentage below, it corrected here and it's below the 58, which is not the end of the world, not the end of the world. This was pretty bad right here, but look at where it is now. Yeah. Okay. It broke and it broke bad. It got extended below the 50. It rallied. It's extending a low again below the 50. And this volume day yesterday was really meaningful. That was 65 million shares. Yeah. Um, the sector's tainted. You know, I had, a, I had a boss who was pretty darn smart when I was this 30 years ago. And I had a stock that um, did not get an FDA approval. And the stock imploded. And he comes in my office and I had so much of the stock. I had every, every account was in it. He goes, Jim, he goes, it's tainted. Get out of it. He goes, it's just tainted. He goes, you can come back if, if the taint goes away, you know, if, the, if the smell goes away, but it's under massive distribution, just get out. And I think that that may be the case here. And I'm gonna go way off script. You throw a softball up, I'm gonna run all over the place. Oh, go for it, go for it. This is a stretch, okay? But the world of crypto is going to disrupt finance first. It's not, uh, now listen, I thought back when I started my crypto fund three, four years ago, that people were going to be sick of paying, you know, retailers are going to be sick of paying 4% to Visa and MasterCard, and that it would be much easier to accept crypto. And I thought that I was using, I was ready to short these stocks three, four years ago as a signal that crypto was being accepted, adopted. Mm -hmm. Now I was way early and I was wrong and I never shorted them because they didn't blow up, but now they are and the adoption rate of crypto is exploding. And I have to wonder in the back of my mind, are these, now this is a stretch, okay? I don't have any information to prove this, but why are these stocks going bad when all the other financials are breaking out? Is it KRB, is that the financial index? Or uh, I'm not uh, sure. I don't know what it is. There's XLF. Um, yeah, yeah, XLF. Is this a bank or a uh, financial? I mean, uh, yeah, Listen, finance, all the financials yeah. breaking out and MasterCard and Visa are going down and mm -hmm. crypto is emerging. I don't know if it's correlated, but I'm always looking for the fundamentals that support the trend. Mm -hmm. Can I tell a quick story? Go for it. There's a um, research director and a rookie broker comes in, a rookie analyst comes in and the research director goes, hey, rookie, he goes, write me a research report on Cisco Systems. And the kid looks up and goes, you want a bullish or a bearish report? There's always a myriad of reasons why it should go down and a myriad of reasons why it should go up. But I'm looking for the reasons that support the trend. I, if it's in an uptrend, I don't care about the bear case, unless there's a potential pothole, like a, a lawsuit that might be resolved or whatever. But in general, you omit the evidence that doesn't support the trend and you lean into the evidence that does, I, you know, I don't want to fight the trend. Um, and I'm, man, I'm going to take this so far off script today. Go for it. All Here's a, e um, I'm going to do my best. There's a crane shares thing. It's an ETF that mirrors the Chinese commercial paper market. So if the Chinese, this is the Chinese commercial paper market. Okay, let, let's really quick, just go back to 2020. This is the bear market of 20 when the basically the financial markets in the world seized up. Mm -hmm. That's the low. Well, what's going on in the Chinese commercial paper markets right now, if this is where we are? And this is a broadly diversified crypt, uh, commercial fund. Now it, it's a, a, a tiny, tiny little market cap, okay? But there's like 15 or 20 different pieces of commercial paper in here. This is a good representative of what's going on. And the credit default swaps on China are ramping. It doesn't matter. 
okay? It, the Chinese indexes may have bottomed. So this is really bad news, but the Chinese indexes have kind of turned up here. So what do you do? You omit the information that doesn't support the trend, which kind of tripped me up a little bit. I had a very big short position on in the broad market just prior to the follow through day because the market was at the lows and I saw this and I, I was matching up these fundamentals with the current trend at the moment. So anyway, this is a very long story to tell you. There's always bear and bull cases for everything. You find the evidence that supports the trend of the security you're looking at. And I'm, let's go to another question. Perfect. Um, <laughs> and let's want to ask me something. No, that's perfect. Um, going back a little bit uh, to, to actually use coin as an example. Um, I noticed at MarketSmith that next year, uh, the annual estimates are actually down 45%, the, the annual EPS estimates. I wanted to hear your take. We're kind of in the fourth quarter now. It seems like next year's estimates are um, are more relevant than, than this year's. Uh, what are your take on annual estimates in general, and how, how should we kind of interpret these numbers? I consider it to be one of my valuable metrics that forward estimates are really big. Mm -hmm. But... I remember I owned a stock called Four Systems 20 years ago, and I'll overstate the case, but analysts were estimating 30% growth mm -hmm. or 30 cents for the next year. They earned like a dollar sixty. Analysts, the analysts are not institutions. They're, they don't have any skin in the game. They're not buying or selling the stock. They're just recommending the institutions buying the stock. Those are the guys who have their job on the line. And they're saying that this number of 701 is not real. You know, I'm going to follow the trend of the stock in light. That's okay. That's negative information that mm -hmm. doesn't support the trend. I'm following the trend in light of that negative information. I'm assuming that the Fidelities and the Goldman's and these monster hedge funds have done way deeper research than the analyst himself. I mean, so I'm omitting it. I own the stock mm -hmm. and I've owned plenty of stocks where, oh my God, one of the greatest stocks in history, Nvidia. Mm -hmm. I was buying large, I bought an enormous position the day of earnings because it was ramping on a crazy, insane volume. And well, first of all, Eve calls me up in the middle of she's like, hey, moron. <laughs> she's like, they report tonight. And then she's like, and by the way, earnings are supposed to be down next year. And I said, yeah, I said, both those things might be true, but the market says this is going higher. And I omitted the future earnings estimate to be down and even after the first gap, and this is the very first gap up, this was years ago, mm -hmm. the earnings estimates remained flat for a couple quarters. And it ended up, they, they destroyed estimates. So analyst estimates going forward are wonderful if they're enormous. It's, it's a plus. Yeah. If, it's, if they're not, it is a slight negative, but it's not going to keep me out of a stock that's raging. Gotcha. And uh, you mentioned NVIDIA. I think that's a great one to look at um, if you could bring that up. Uh, and and also just discussing the overall semiconductor space because this is once again kind of a leading group um, and, and always one to look for ideas. AMD is also strong. But yeah, what, what's kind of your take on NVIDIA? Well, you know, this has been after uh, Tesla, this has been your bull market stock. Mm -hmm. And it was very unnerving to me for a long period of time. Like you can see this line I've drawn. Mm -hmm. This is the SF matrix, the broad semiconductor index. It just, it couldn't get going. It would break out and shake out and break out and shake out. And I was also watching Xilinx a lot because it is the 5G chip leader. Yeah. And it tried multiple times, but I think the either, look, you, you, I, you, there was no handle here and it didn't break out, but it caved in. It did clear here and then it caved in, caved in again, tried to break out here, it went sideways. I mean, you could have been stopped out on this a million times. Mm -hmm. Now the volume was never adequate really to get in, but you can see where it's trying, 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 trying. Well, all of a sudden it's going. AMD has been going for a long time. Um, look, NVIDIA, NVDA is your absolute leader if you, look right here comp rating 99 yeah it has i believe five or six not just institutions but of the very best institutions they're they're all in it and why it trades 
average daily volume, 26 million shares at 250. This mm -hmm. is, you, you could buy, you, you could market order 100,000 shares and it will barely move. It'll move four cents. This is a place where whales can go. I mean, big, the biggest whales. Yeah. It's almost like if you have a monster fund, you have to own this name. The ratio between high earnings growth and heavy liquidity is going to tell you how big the PE is going to get. Okay. It's always going to be higher when you have super high liquidity because the whales are going to crowd in there as there were some tiny little semiconductor that trades, you know, $30 million with a daily dollar volume. I don't care how big the earnings are. The PE is going to be lower because no whales can get into it. Yeah. Um, you know, this stock really, it broke out right here. I bought it. I held it all through here. I might've stopped out of a tiny bit here, but I added, and here, this bothered me a lot. Mm -hmm. Monday, it broke out, but no volume came in. It was actually slightly below average. So I was talking about that on my podcast on Monday night, and I come in on Tuesday yesterday, and it explodes out. So I went right in and I added some more shares. This is your, this is a major signal that the market is more healthy. Mm -hmm. It is a little disturbing that it's coming out so late, but I think this, it really broke out here. This was the dead lows on like, you know, the indexes right here. And then we turned our follow through day was probably like right there. Mm -hmm. So I think this is really a great stock. I mean, it's absolutely, listen, I called it Tesla and this are, you know, and, and net in the lower market cap. Yeah. This is 610 billion market cap. Tesla's over a trillion. Cloudflare NET is 49 billion. So I'm sorry, this is 610 billion. Mm -hmm. Those are your monster canaries in the coal mine. As long as these stocks are above their 50s or close, we're in a bull market. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, one more stock I, I'd love to hear your take on is Asana, A-S-A-N. Um, yeah, once again, another stock that, that's run a lot is definitely extended a little bit, but um, is showing a lot of power and, and, and looks like it, it, if the market is right, could ramp up and keep trending. So I've been watching this forever and I, you know, I did not consider this to be a long, a long enough base, but it could have been a basketball underwater again, where it bases, breaks out, shakes out, breaks out sideways. But this right, when the volume came in right here, mm -hmm. 7.7 .7 million shares. That's a very big day. Um, I don't know what these guys do. Okay. Um, and th there's so many of these software stocks that have no earnings. It's we're really in this rare environment where institutions are willing to be so much more patient with companies that don't have earnings, but there's two dozen of these uh, cloud companies that have no earnings. This is a very powerful one. Uh, Roll to strength 99 composite rating is 75 because they don't have the earnings. If they had the earnings, I would suggest this would be 95, 94, 97, 8, 9. Yeah. Um, but it, it just kind of got away. You know, there wasn't a big digestion in here. Mm -hmm. So when you move out without a digestion, there's not enough time for the people to take their profits. You're going to shake out harder. And that's what's going on. The market, you know, was pulled back a little bit. I just think we need some more basing, not just with this, but all, all these monster leaders just need a little time, get those 50 day moving averages to get up a little closer to the stocks or maybe them to uh, catch support or undercut them. And uh, we need a little time. These, these, these guys have run really, the horses need to be watered and rested. Right. Right. And going a little bit back to the crypto theme, are there any miners that you're really interested in? Um, I don't know if you've personally got a position or you're just watching them like uh, HUT, HUT, um, or, or another company? See, I feel like these names, they just grossly underperform the raw coins. I would say the, the physical coins, but there are no physical coins. Yeah. But to, to own the real coin, like, um, I'll just tell you, the, the GTBC, whatever that, the ETFs, the e Ether and Bitcoin. So last time I looked, Ethereum was up 350% for the year and the ETEH trust was up like 125 yeah bitcoin's up call it 100 percent for the year and the bitcoin trust is up 40 percent 30 percent you get 100 percent of the performance on the downside on the bad down days and you get 40 percent or less of the upside 
just by the coins, the raw coins. Now, if you don't have a, and I understand the ETF and the accessibility, people don't want to spend the time to open the account at Coinbase or Gemini or wherever. Um, it's worth the time. This is an industry where it's a sector of the a global economy where everyone is going to be affected. This, like I said, it's the most important revel or innovation, I think, in forever. It's going to change everything. So the long answer is I don't like any of these equity driven. I mean, coin C-O-I-N is an exchange and I, I understand it's probably not going to move like the raw coins will, but it's a, I, I can buy it with the thought process of it's an exchange. It's not the coin. I'm not trying to capture the performance of the coin. I have a whole other crypto hedge fund for that. Um, I don't like them. They don't perform like the coins. I would just buy the coins and the coins chart so well. Yeah. They really, really do. Could you actually bring up uh, some charts of uh, Bitcoin or Ethereum? I, I'd love to get your take on on uh, its price action. It just just broke out, but then pull, is pulling back now. Um, I'd love to hear kind of your analysis and, and outlook the next the next few months or so. I love this stock that, that this coin that's breaking out right now. It's called Helium. Uh, I just had a big meeting with my partner Sam, who does all the a lot of the research, and Helium is just dying. It's 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 it has a good chance to change the telecommunications industry especially the 5g play they likely have found a way to um the fundamentals are very deep here and I, the, the problem with 5g is it only projects out a very short distance mm -hmm. and helium may have a way around that um it's a decentralized telecommunications i believe direct tv or um one of the major players just uh has has a joint venture with them as of last night but let's just look at it really quick let's do it now again i'm just employing the same things that bill o'neill taught me to the to, to crypto it's relatively stronger look at okay so this is what helium's doing and then let's compare it against eth eth's pulling back right bitcoin's really pulling back um you know uh, the what the the etf came out what day right right through here and we peaked right there. Mm -hmm. I mean, listen, I believe that this is going to be just fine. And I think we're going significantly higher. Um, but these major news announcements, the, the futures contract came out, it, it, it peaked. Coinbase comes public, it peaked. Now we have the ETF. It's, it may be peaking again. Now, the flip side of that is the third time it may not work that we get a major news innovation. Yeah. And the on-chain metrics for crypto, for Bitcoin's are, are extremely bullish. Mm -hmm. The funding rates on the futures contracts are getting excessive. And these, listen, there's something going on with crypto that hasn't been seen by the rest of the world ever, as far as I can tell, where these foreign exchanges are offering 50 times leverage, 100 times leverage, 125 times leverage. Until those drug dealers, those are not exchanges, they're, they're dealing yeah. drugs. Okay? They're, not, they're not trying to help anybody. Until those players get out of the market, you're going to have these flushes because you can't have leverage like that. Any system that has leverage like that in it is going to be prone to these wicked, wicked pullbacks. Right. Um, but I'm willing to endure those to be in probably the most transformative technology that I've seen. Um, the chart right here is we've had a, a good run and a breakout. We do have some negative volume, short term downtrend. Uh, so far, it's short term on a very, very uber short-term bait. I hate short charts, but there might be a little head and shoulders going on in here. Mm -hmm. But, you know, Ethereum looks better, but again, it is breaking the short-term trend. It doesn't mean that we can't just go sideways for it. It does not have to go down. Yeah. I mean, and the other thing is this, there's a lot to say about this, but Robinhood announced a wallet for crypto they have 1 million people waiting for it. 1 million. Right now, there's nearly zero major market strategists recommending exposure to crypto. There's a couple, I think Kramer said maybe three or four or 5%, but there's been no major players. What happens when Goldman Sachs comes out and says, everybody needs 10%? That, that could happen in, it could happen tomorrow. Mm -hmm. In five or six or 10 years, I'll bet you it's going to be 20%. It might be more. 
where are these, where is the value of these coins going to be then? Um, you know, I am crazy bullish on this. This is just such a nascent market. It's, I mean, they're just building out the plumbing, the infrastructure. Um, and I was at Morgan Stanley and I, you know, when they, I was a broker in 94, the mm -hmm. internet was not, we didn't even have the internet on our computers, on our desks yet, but I watched Netscape come public and just all of the build out. Of, and it, it's so identical to me. It's just replaying all over again, except one difference. The rate of adoption is faster. Imagine a technology that is as transformative with a faster rate of adoption. Now, let's go backwards. In 1998 or four or whatever, what if you would have bought one one hundred thousandth of the whole internet, which was possible if you had a couple million bucks? You'd be the richest man, one of the wealthiest people in the world. I think that opportunity, that that opportunity is kind of out the door. But if you put, look, this is an asymmetric trade. You put a hundred grand, a million, you put 5% of your net worth in this, 10% right now, 20%, and it works. And it, you're going to be an uber wealthy person in 10, 20 years, 5, 10, 20 years. Um, so the charts, they're a little choppy here. I see no reason why they couldn't go sideways or even just keep going. Um, a correction could be in play, but I'm just going to let the chart tell me. And I'm much more of a hodler than I am. I believe in this much more fundamentally. I don't want to dislodge my coins, but I am trying to smooth volatility mm -hmm. that when these do get over the 50 and 200 by a historically large margin, I will trim off some. And I have done that a few times when it was grossly excessive, but not a lot. And I'm, I'm really just trying to dampen volatility. I, I'm a believer in this for a long period of time. And there will be corrections, just like when the build out of the internet occurred. I mean, I've watched Yahoo and uh, Amazon correct 70% plus many times. That is going to continue to happen here. That's, that is in the cards. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and what are the kind of five or so top coins in your mind that people should do their research on? What, what are the true market leaders when it comes to crypto? Look on the right side. Can you see my whole screen? Yep. Well, I own a very big position in ICP. I am I was in the private placement, uh, which happens to be down 11% today. But Ethereum, Bitcoin, uh, Scale, I was in the private placement of that. Polkadot, I bought in my own personal account five, six, seven, in the last two weeks. Mm -hmm. um, that's Helium, Solana, Uniswap, Binance, Filecoin. Uh, I think Yearn was mm -hmm. YFI has Aave. You know, listen, I kind of have a thought process here of liquid leaders are going to dominate. So relatively, str uh, relatively strong liquid leaders that are in the top 20 or 30% market cap of coin market cap are where all the action is going to be. I mean, that's not true. You can get some of these little names that are undiscovered pop 400% in a day, but I'm not, I'm not trying to play in the junk. I'm not trying to, you know, hit a roulette. Yeah. Okay. If you stay in the top 30 market cap coins, so say you're in it and if it falls out for say three months and you just dump it and you stay in there, mm -hmm. you're going to be in the, in the big winners. And remember there's something like 5,500 cryptocurrencies or coins when the, Henry Ford invented the Model T. I think they spawned 200 auto manufacturers over the next 15, 20 years. It boiled down to about eight or 10. Yeah. The exact, of the 5,500 coins, I think they will be in the end, I don't know, 30, 40 of them. They're mostly going to zero. So you need to stay in the highest market cap coins with a little RS. If you just stay up there in that top 30, you're never going to zero. Okay. If it falls below 30 for three, four months, you just get out of it and you might have to take a significant hit on it, but you're not going to go to zero and you will be in the ones they're going to win. So, um, that's kind of my, I I'm very fundamental in this, not just technical. Yeah. I'm very fundamental all the time. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, so, so how would you recommend somebody build exposure to crypto if right now they've got 0% of their net worth, um, invested in the space? You know, 
it's really, really tricky because I, I was so fortunate that I, I was able to, um, when I started my first hedge fund with my partner, Matt, crypto was in a mad run and we didn't do anything. And then it, there was a very big pullback and we ended up starting our ether position at 250. So we waited for a very big pullback. I do know we are in a ramping period right now. And I would not, I would, I would certainly, I would, I would not put all your money in right now. There's just no way we're mm -hmm. too elevated. The bull market's been on for a while. The halvening just occurred last year. I would, if you have to get in, I'd put 20% of your money in today, 30% of your money. If you have a great big cushion, I would add, because I do think we're ramping here. Okay. Mm -hmm. I do believe we're going to continue in this cycle, but I would really wait for a bear market. This is, you're not going to miss anything if you wait and uh, we get a bear market. And I just like anything else, I'd wait for the RSs to turn up and I'd, I'd start, you know, working my way in, but buying right here, after a major, major fundamental news announcement of these ETFs is probably asking for some trouble. Right. right. That doesn't mean we won't be way higher by December, but I don't know where we might go short term. We got to shake out these uh, highly leveraged people first, but the fundamentals are great. And we've got a tiny little trend break right now mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so far. <laughs> and when you, when you buy, buy, uh, buy, crypto um are you buying at, at breakouts just like that or are you adopting more of a longer term dollar cost average approach uh when when dealing with these names i have primarily waited i have almost never started a whole position on a breakout i've generally started them in in bear markets the the volatility in these coins is unlike anything i've ever dealt with before yeah height stops here is almost a lock you're going to get stopped out Mm -hmm. So you really need to start in a bear and work your way in and be willing to go draw down on your initial position. Okay. It's the volatility. Listen, 10% in a day is, is no big deal. So if you're, you know, three, five, seven does not work here. You will be stopped out. And so you need to start smaller and build your position over time, much more preferably after a bear. And I, I, again, I wouldn't even wait for if a bear market looks like it ended and the MAs all turn up, forget digestion just get in there and start start pyramiding in um the simple answer to that is do not start a position here and go all in i think you'll get yeah. stopped yeah and be more of a hodler than a but if you're a short-term trader do whatever you want yeah. but if you're an intermediate term trend trader or god forbid you're like me like you just believe getting in now is a recipe for problems short term gotcha gotcha um, Jim, I, I had the pleasure of talking with David Ryan uh, a few days ago, and I asked him this question, which, which I want to ask you as well. Um, what are some key things that Bill O'Neill um, passed on to you? What, what key advice did he give you that, that you still remember to this day? I think the, I mean, I think you're looking for a stock rule or a tip and my real anything, answer, anything, okay. yeah. Anybody who applies himself with discipline and consistency for long periods can become anything in America. I mean, you could go, you literally could come from a foster home to a billionaire. It's happened in America. Anything is possible in America. And I kind of cooked this up myself. I said, I say it all the time. As long as the golden goose of capitalism is not suffocated by socialism, the next Blackberry, the next Tesla, the next General Electric, the next Apple, they're never going to stop coming. So the other thing that I learned, I learned from Bill is if you screw up, it's chill. Don't do it again, but there's going to be the next Tesla just around the corner. Right. So don't feel like if you're just graduating college and you just get your first job and you're making your, you're able to say five, 10 grand in the first year. If you don't be trying to lever this up to make a couple hundred thousand dollars immediately, you don't have to run so hard these leaders are never going to stop coming as long as capitalism is the dominant financial system we operate under. As long Bill's, you know, Bill was a huge free market advocate and he taught me the free market gives people incentive to create these companies, these drugs to revolutionary, to change people's lives. Mm -hmm. It's the system we live in that keeps birthing these golden geese of wealth and prosperity. And I mean, it's prosperity for everybody because the, you know, the invention of the washing machine 
saved women in third world countries half a day's work. Okay. I mean, Westinghouse or whoever invented Maytag, they made money on it, but the quality of life exploded in third world countries on the invention of the washing machine. Um, the, it's innovation. It's this disruptive technology. And Bill just hammered home. Anybody can do anything if you try. Now, maybe people don't want to lever, lever up and, you know, go from first class to private jet. And that's chill. If you want to just go home and flip on the tube and just relax, that's great. But I think everybody in America wants a piece of the pie. It's in your DNA to get status, to gentrify. That's just the way most people are. And I, I think the opportunity is here in America. It's not in other countries. America is a one-way street. No one's leaving. I looked it up. 3,000 people forgave or gave up their citizenship last year. We have people sacrificing their life possibly to come here. There's a reason for that. And we all just take it for granted. Um, you know, I, I want to go back for back, backwards. In this system, you and I are going to invent something. It's going to blossom. We're going to need capital to build a factory. So we go public. Boom. Sales occur. 100% sales growth. 100% sales growth. First earnings report. They, we beat by 300%. It forms a perfect cup and handle. It's got the RS. It's got the estimates. It's got the institutions. This is never going to stop. You, it, It'll stop when you break human DNA. Or you bring in socialism. But until that occurs, this is just going to continue on. So don't sweat it if you screw it up. Just chill, we'll figure out what you did wrong and redouble your efforts in, with more discipline. And anybody can do this. I am, I had, a, I had a great parents, but they were divorced. I have dyslexia. I was in learning disabled classes all the way into college. I did not have good grades, but I used to drive my car to the paper depot at midnight every night to get the next day's newspaper, okay? I was relentless in following the teachings of Bill O'Neill. I am a knockoff artist. I didn't invent anything. I said, the, Jap the Japanese had it right. Let the Americans invent it. They'll get one, they'll tear it apart, copy it, and then they'll just sell it cheaper. Why, why reinvent the wheel? The master wrote four books on exactly how to handle this. You don't need 30 books. Just master the top four books. That's all you need. You need no more than the top four. Bill's book, Reminiscences, Darvis's book, um, you know, and a few others. Yeah. That's all you need. And that, well, one amazing book on psychology or go see a shrink. Yeah. That's even better. Yeah. How about, what did I learn from Bill? I learned that anybody who applies himself can go anywhere. Like I'm probably not going to slam dunk a, a basketball because of physical size, but the plateaus in life that you can go to through effort are all attainable for everybody. How about that? Yeah, th that's that's a great place to leave it. Jim, it's always a pleasure. I uh, love talking with you. And um, yeah, uh, I know you, you, you're, you've you been running Growth Stock Mentor. I, I wanted to give you a little bit of, of time to, to talk about that and, and uh, tell people kind of what you're doing. So I, I think it's no secret. Anybody who knows about me, I love to play golf. And I, I play and there's caddies there. And, you know, caddies get to know you. And my partner, who I founded my crypto hedge fund with, sorry, was my cat. He was a caddy. Yeah. And he would come in my office, this office, and we would talk markets and stock. And he would, he was in the, I just got access to his, he passed away. I just got access to his account. He's a caddy. Now he's, he passed away last year at 30, 29. And his account was seven figures. Okay. Kid founded three crypto companies, one blockchain phone with me. But the point is all these caddies want to learn about the market. So I say, come in and see me, come in and see me. All of a sudden I've got 15 or 18 of them. And over the years, it's been like 30. I can't spend that much time. I cannot say, read three chapters, come in to 20 or 30 people. So this is a way I can reach endless of thousands of people. Every Monday, I do a one hour live presentation on my research I did over the weekend. And then I take questions until they're gone. If it takes two hours, I answer every single question. So if you're reading O'Neill's book and you want someone to mentor you or, or, or walk you through it, uh, now, I'm not Bill O'Neill, but I have been doing this for 30 years, and I've got a good long-term track record. I can teach you what Bill taught me, and it's cheap. It's 100 bucks a month, and then every Wednesday, I put out comments on the market like a mini ride-the-wave plan, and it's just a way I can communicate and uh, teach. Bill O'Neill was a teacher. I think Bill personally had a dual mandate. He did not care about money. He wanted to defeat capitalism 
support free markets and teach the average man how to trade and gentrify his life. And if I can do half of that through Growth Stock Mentor, I'm a massive winner. I love it. I love to teach. It rocks my world. It keeps me on my A game. Right. So you say, hey, Jim, what does this stock do? Well, I better know. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll have a, a link to that down below as well as your Twitter. Um, yeah. Thanks again, Jim, for, for coming on. It's always a pleasure. And uh, yeah, looking forward to doing this again. Dude, why don't we diagnose a couple of trades next time? Yeah, that'd be awesome. That'd be awesome. Uh, with that, um, for everybody watching, I hope you enjoyed. Remember to leave a like down below and subscribe if you're new to the channel. And we'll see you guys in future videos. Thanks. Thank you.